I was reading a magazine. And a car, my face, took us on the left and moved into the tablet. dashboard where a radio the was. The person driving the car. So the seatbelt pulled on my stomach and we had to move it. I smashed most, most of these bones on the right side of my face. Curved. I lost the right and arm. And the car started going into violent And speed. eventually I got taken to the I was in the Johannesburg Hospital. I was in the Johannesburg Hospital. For about a month. So I lay on the side of the road. Reading machines for about an hour while paramedics support resuscitating me. I just remember waking up and looking at a white ceiling. I didn't realize that I'd been in an accident. I just heard people around me talking, one of the doctors speaking to my mum, telling her about my chances of survival that night and what surgery I had to go through next. I was in a lot of pain. Eventually, after that month of being there, I was discharged. And I didn't know where to begin. You know, I knew there was a lot of damage to my face, but I was never really sure where I had to start. I had to spend a lot of time researching on exactly what kind of surgeons I needed. It was a microsurgeon and a cosmetic surgeon and a reconstructive surgeon and then a craniofacial surgeon and then it overlapped into a craniofacial maxillofacial surgeon. It was just extremely confusing. And, you know, I was finding myself running between the specialists with written notes with terms I'd never heard of and complications that could happen if the other surgeon did the surgery in areas that they were working. To get them to talk to each other was extremely difficult. So seven years down the line of failing surgeries, I ended up with a bad infection. So I remember I went to the shop one day. I walked out of the shop and suddenly there was a whole lot of fluid coming out of my face. I didn't know what it was. So I got hold of one of my doctors. Within a couple of days, we had to do a debridement of the prosthetic that was in my face. And it was ongoing. We would do the debridement, and two months later, I would get the infection back again, but worse. A year down the line, it was so bad that every day I was looking in the mirror to clean my face from this infection, I could almost see the prosthetics coming through the skin. And by then, I'd really lost huge portions of my face. So my plastic surgeon said to me, look, I, I don't care if you sue me, I'm taking this prosthetic out because something, the infection is on there and it won't go away until we take it out. And so he did, he had it tested and it was riddled with MRSA, with antibiotic resistance. I didn't know what MRSA was. Eventually I read on the internet that taking these antibiotics were actually feeding the bacteria. And I just started searching the internet for as many of the best doctors I could find. Eventually, somebody replied, and it was a face transplant surgeon. So he explained to me what needed to be done. And at the end of that call, he said to me, now take this information and go find a doctor that mimics it, which I did. And eventually I found one who was classed as one of the best in the world. So I went to him and we did the surgeries. And within two surgeries in eight months, my face was perfect. If all those 10 years I used to have to cover my face with iPads, glasses, you know, you name it, I, I couldn't show people my face. I couldn't walk out into public because I'd just get stares. And that day was the best day of my life, that I could walk out and I felt like a human being again. I don't remember the accident in 2004. I only remember waking up to a white ceiling. Unable to move heavily drugged, having fits, and hearing machines pump air into my lungs. I'd suffered massive injuries to my abdomen and my face. When I finally worked up the courage to look at myself in the mirror, I saw a mess. My face needed to be reconstructed with different types of super specialists. Each of them were tissue specific, so the maxillofacial surgeon worked on the bone, the plastic surgeon on the skin, ENT on the sinuses, and the neurosurgeon with nerves. Their advice overlapped, which confused me, and I found myself in tears trying to coordinate care between them. For seven years, my surgeries were failing. 
In 2011, we implanted my fourth facial prosthetic, and a few weeks later, I developed an infection. Every day, I watched a bacterial discharge eat the flesh off my face. I underwent multiple debridement surgeries and heavy doses of antibiotics to try and clear the infection, but it kept coming back worse. Almost 11 months passed, and I hardly had a face left. In a final emergency, the prosthetic was removed. It was riddled with MRSA, a fatal superbug called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which was resistant to the penicillin antibiotics that I was taking. Four months later, and a course of a different antibiotic called vancomycin, the infection disappeared. I couldn't explain where MRSA came from, but I knew I couldn't rely on penicillin to get me through any more surgeries. During those seven years, I'd been through a medical legal trial which had accumulated 53 doctor's reports. I summarised them into four pages, searched the web for the best doctors in the world, and pleaded for help. One day, a face transplant surgeon called Dr. Edward Caddison in Boston, working on cases like mine, was willing to offer a video call. He explained what I needed to do in as few surgeries as possible, and armed with his advice, I found South African doctors who could perform them. A mere eight months, two surgeries, and a third antibiotic called clindamycin, my face was finally fixed. Since MRSA, I've done whatever I can to understand antibiotic resistance. Bacteria were one of the first life forms on Earth, and there are trillions of species around us. Some strains of bacteria even exist in our body as part of an ecosystem called a microbiome, and when they're exposed to threatening environments, like too many antibiotics, over a long period of time, they can adapt to survive. Staphylococcus is a species of bacteria that lives mainly on our skin and noses, even on healthy people. But if they enter our body through a wound or respiratory tract, they can cause infections like pneumonia or sepsis. More than 30 different strains of Staphylococci can cause infections, but the most common strain is Staphylococcus aureus. In 1928, a scientist called Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, which could kill the aureus strain, and today it's our most common antibiotic. However, in 1961, scientists discovered the first patient carrying a penicillin-resistant mutation and called it MRSA. In 2016, the World Health Organization reported that antibiotic resistance had become one of the biggest threats to global health and that we need harmonized, multi-sectoral systems to tackle it. About 700,000 people worldwide die annually due to drug-resistant bacteria, and by 2050, that could rise to 10 million, which is more than cancer. The biggest cause of MRSA is the overuse and incorrect use of antibiotics, but it can also be acquired in hospitals, spread in public places through skin-to-skin -skin contact, or from contaminated surfaces and objects. We overuse antibiotics in our pets and in the meat we eat too. Multi-drug resistant strains of bacteria also affect diseases like TB, HIV AIDS, and malaria. The antibiotics you give your child for an ear infection use after surgery or rely on to save your life will become useless if we don't stop squandering them. We have to promote proper use of antibiotics more aggressively, not only in human and animal health, but in food safety too. Patients need to be informed about the risks of overexposure to antibiotics and understand when they are appropriate so they don't self-medicate for the wrong conditions like flu, or put pressure on their doctor to prescribe antibiotics for minor infections that can be treated with alternatives. Infection prevention has to be strengthened by teaching the public good hygiene to reduce the spread of germs. Travelling citizens must understand how bacteria is spreading across our borders. There are no new antibiotics on the way either, so we have to innovate solutions like digital tools that help us collect data to understand the mechanisms of bacterial resistance. Just like climate change, antibiotic resistance is a threat to every one of us globally, 
And if we don't take action against it together now, as human beings living in one world, the microbial world will win. Thank you. <laughs>